there we are. Perfect. Uh, so thanks everyone uh, for coming to our session. Uh, this one today being about choosing a treatment option for kidney failure. Uh, I'm Dr. Mike Bevilacqua, a nephrologist over uh, in Surrey, uh, and we have a great session here with a whole lot of great presenters. So I hope that you guys are all looking forward to it. Um, before we get started, although we're all meeting virtually, it's great to reflect which parts of it is uh, from the province that we're each coming from, or maybe even beyond, for those of you who are coming from elsewhere. Uh, myself, I come from the territories of the Katsi, Semiamu, Kwantlen, and some other Coast Salish peoples. Uh, and again, taking a moment to reflect on which part of our, our great province you're all coming from uh, is, is a worthwhile uh, thing to do on this great Friday. Okay, but otherwise, uh, in terms of today's session, uh, if this is your first time here, fantastic and welcome. Uh, if you've come to our sessions before, welcome back. Uh, if you've been before, you'll know this is one in a whole series of different uh, sessions. And this is one that we offer on a, on a repeated basis, this, this item about uh, choosing a treatment for kidney failure. Just as a little bit of, of housekeeping, though, um, for anything that you want to go back and look on, all of these sessions are recorded. So that includes today's session, within a couple of weeks or so, will be up there on the website. If you want to go and re-watch anything uh, that you want to see for a second time from what you've heard today. Or we have all of our previous sessions, a whole library of them up there. So if there are other topics that you want to read through, it's all available as well. And if you hadn't already had a chance to do so, if you go to that website and hit this subscribe now button and you put your information in, you'll actually get alerted to when the sessions are coming up. We do them about four times a year. You'll get a little uh, alert to, to remind you to register and to make sure that you can attend to uh, the next one live. So that's, that's all on our BC Renal website and you'll find all of these uh, information on the sessions. For today, another um, uh, good point is that we actually have a series of presentations that cover similar topics to what we're going to do today. So in addition to going back to watching the recording of today, you'll find that there are these self-directed presentations about each of our treatment options that you can go through as well. Uh, so this is all, it's a slightly different part of that same BC Renal website on your treatments for kidney failure. And you can actually find all of these that are available, not just in English, but in a host of different language options uh, as well. Okay, but so in terms of the session, just a bit of housekeeping before we get into the content here. Uh, so as you can tell from uh, already the way this is running, we have you muted and we have your cameras off so we can't see or hear you. This is for privacy <laughs> reasons since these sessions are being recorded. Um, but we do still want you to be able to get questions in, even though you can't uh, unmute yourself. So the way that you do that is going to the question and answer box. So on your little Zoom, that'll be the one with two speech bubbles beside each other, the one that says Q&A. And if you type your question in and, and uh, put it up, what we'll do is I'll collect those. And then when there's a break in the presentation, I'll, have, I'll bring it to the presenters to, to address it. The one little point I always remind people is that um, our presenters today won't be able to answer very specific questions about your own individual medical situation. So if it's a very, very specific one, I'll kind of remind you to take that back to your own kidney team to discuss your own unique situation. But we'll, we'll make it so that it's a general question that the whole group can, can learn from. Okay, so get your questions in there as much as you like, and we'll address them. as we go. Okay, but then otherwise, so just to briefly introduce our topic today, again, this is talking about choosing a treatment option for kidney failure. So since there are many different, multiple different options available, we're going to take you through an, uh, an overview of what each of those are. On those recordings I mentioned before, we actually have more detailed uh, presentations about each one of these options in a lot more detail. This is the big overview of all of the various ones. And the whole goal here is to uh, give you some information to think about as you go back and discuss this with your kidney care team. So very specifically, this isn't meant to replace those conversations. That's really the most important thing is having that one-on-one -on -one conversation with your kidney team. But this is to inform you and give you information to go well prepared into those conversations. And we know that people register for these, these sessions or come to these sessions at various stages, including many people who are before they get to that point, which is great. We actually wanted to highlight that with this slide to say that these, looking at these various treatment options is one of those items that you really want to be thinking about well in advance, planning ahead. You know, kidneys, uh, kidneys provide such important function for, for your life that 
there, you really do need to think of a treatment option if you get to the point where they're not working. And since we have different options available, some of which might be better for different individuals, some of it might fit better for your lifestyle compared to others, thinking about this and really having time to reflect well before you ever get to that point is, is an important thing to do. So that's kind of our, our theme of the day here. Okay, but with that, that's enough for me. I'm now going to turn it over. And you see, we've got a great lineup of people. This is the one I think we have the most presenters out of any of the sessions we offer on, on the one today because there's so much to cover. So we're very fortunate we've got our team from Fraser Health who's going to be uh, presenting uh, these various topics. So we have Sandra who will start off with a general introduction to the concept. Uh, Christina is going to take us through some information about transplants. Leilani is going to talk to us about peritoneal dialysis. Zoila is going to be talking to us about facility-based hemodialysis. Cindy will talk to us about home hemodialysis. And then back to Sandra for, the, for talking about conservative care. And then in addition to our team from Fraser Health, we're also super fortunate that we have on the call as well, two patient partners who have actually lived through experiences with this treatment modality. And that's Deb and Barry. And we very much look forward to hearing from them as well. So a whole great lineup for you this afternoon. And with that, I'll take my screen down and I'll pass it over to Sandra, who's going to get us started. Okay, perfect. There you go. Oh, and you're still in mute, though, Sandra. I, I can tell you're off to you're already off to a great start presenting. Just we can't hear you. So. <laughs> okay. There we go. Now we've got audio and video. Perfect. Okay. Just a second here. Now I've um, I'm done here. Okay. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. Okay. So um, I'm Sandra, and I'm going to um, work you through the beginning part of it that's going to give you some ideas to and some suggestions on what to think about as we go through the modality education. Um, so in this presentation, you'll learn about the choices you have when your kidneys stop functioning. It's important that you understand all your options so that you can make a choice that is best for you. <clears throat> so the kidneys are vital to our overall, overall health and well-being. Healthy kidneys work to clean the blood by filtering out waste products. Kidney failure leads to serious health complications, and there are a number of treatment options for people whose kidneys are failing. It's important for you to understand all your option, options so that you, supported by your kidney care team, can make the choice that is best for your situation. This chart shows the different levels of kidney function. You might already have some test results showing your GFR or your current level of kidney function. If you know your GFR, you should be able to see where you fit on the chart. If you don't remember your GFR, you may be able to find it in your test results or you can ask your healthcare provider. Most people who are learning about their kidney replacement options are at the 15 to 29 level of GFR shown in the orange box. So in making a decision about treatment options, it's best to think about what's important to you there are a lot of things to consider, and here are just a few. Is it important for you to be in control of your time? Do you tend to do similar things every day, or does your daily schedule change a lot? Are you an independent person, or do you like doing things for yourself, or do you prefer to have things done for you? Do you have a lot of activities in, a, in the day that are important to you, for example, work, volunteering, or family commitments? Would having a diet that restricts what you eat and drink be okay for you, or would you find that difficult? Are you an active person, or do you have a calmer, stay-at-home lifestyle? These are just some of the questions to think about as you learn about the different options. They can help you decide which option is best is a best fit for you. We're going to look at the various treatment options. Um, most people with kidney failure will require more than one type of treatment over their lives. So it's good for you to know about all the options. And sometimes the option you think you would like changes once you learn about the other options or your healthcare team might suggest an, an option that could be a better fit for you and your situation. So it's best to start with an open mind. 
The treatment options available to people going through kidney failure are transplantation, peritoneal dialysis, hemodialysis, including home-based and clinic-based um, hemodialysis, and conservative care. This presentation will explain all of these options so that you have the information that you need to think about while making a choice that's best for you. Okay, and um, I'm gonna introduce um, Christina, who's gonna um, speak about uh, the transplant process now. So I'll just um, stop sharing my slide. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name's Christina. Give me a moment to pull up my information. All right. Hi, everyone. So I want to talk to you today about transplant. And transplant is the preferred choice for most patients with kidney failure. And I'll go into the reasons why in a moment. So what is a kidney transplant? Well, a kidney transplant involves getting a healthy kidney from another person, a kidney donor, and giving it to a person with kidney disease. So you can see in the picture here, the image on the top is a kidney donor and one of their kidneys is being put into the person uh, in the image on the bottom. The surgery takes about four hours. And a lot of people are surprised to hear that, you know, when they get a kidney transplant, a kidney is added and generally uh, their original kidneys are left in place. It's important to realize that having a transplant is not a cure, it is a treatment for kidney failure. And the reason I mention that is because even if you get a kidney transplant, you will still need regular follow up with a doctor, and you will still be taking medications to make sure that kidney stays healthy in your body. So there are two types of kidney transplant. The first one is a living donor transplant. And the second one is a deceased donor transplant. For a living donor transplant, there is no wait list or no um, list of people that are uh, there waiting to, to give their kidneys as living donors. So you are responsible to find your own living donor. A deceased donor kidney transplant, you can have only after you've started dialysis. And that's because there unfortunately aren't enough deceased donor kidneys to go around. So they save those kidneys for people who are in uh, kidney failure or who have already started dialysis. So a living donor transplant, a little bit more about that. So it's exactly as it sounds. Um, a living donor kidney transplant, the kidney comes from someone who is alive. And this person has volunteered to donate one of their kidneys. People are also sometimes surprised to know that people can live a long, normal, healthy life with just one kidney. Someone who does volunteer to donate their kidney will go through a series of tests, a lot of tests, a full medical workup to ensure uh, that they are healthy enough to live with just one kidney and donate one. So a living donor can be someone who's related to you by blood. Uh, it can be a spouse, a friend, a coworker, or even someone that's not known to you. And the majority of patients who do have living donor transplants uh, do find someone in Canada. However, some people also do um, have someone that's known to them in another country, and they can also be a, a living donor in some circumstances. So if and when your kidney team starts the conversation with you about transplant, um, that would be a time where you can get more support and information from your team about how to find a live kidney donor. And when I say your team, that would generally be your, your kidney care clinic, or if you are joining and you're already on dialysis, it will be your dialysis team. So the social workers are good resources, the nurses and the doctors can talk to you about that. So in the case of a deceased donor, the kidney comes from someone who has passed away. 
and who has already agreed to donate the kidney before they passed. So this is a good option if you don't have a living donor. Again, you do have to be on dialysis to receive a deceased donor transplant. Um, and the wait time varies. On the slide here, it says the wait is two to eight years. That has since changed since um, we created these slides. I think um, you know, it's more like five years, give or take, and it's all approximate. Um, the, the, time, the amount of time you have to wait really depends on a number of different factors, on your blood group, presence of antibodies. Um, if and when you get assessed for transplant, the transplant team will give you a better sense of how long you might have to wait uh, for a deceased donor transplant. So even if you do start on dialysis, that doesn't mean that you automatically will get a transplant. You still need to be approved by the transplant team um, because they wanna make sure that you're healthy enough to, to undergo that surgery. So BC Transplant is the agency that takes care of all transplants in British Columbia. So the centers are at St. Paul's Hospital and Vancouver General Hospital. So the transplant center is separate from your kidney team. And so people generally get referred to transplant if their doctor thinks there might, they might be a good candidate and their kidney function drops consistently below a GFR of 25 if you are uh, in the kidney care clinic. So again, not everyone is eligible for a transplant. Uh, people that are eligible for a transplant are people that the, doctor think, the doctors think will do well during the long surgery. So it's important that your heart is strong enough and healthy enough. Um, the doctors need to be convinced that you'll do well with the medications that are involved and um, in general, just cope well with, with having a transplant. For those of you that are interested in anatomy, that's a picture of a real kidney. So transplants do take time. Um, oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, the benefits of having a transplant from a living donor. So there are a number of advantages to having a living donor versus a deceased donor. First of all, the kidneys from a live donor tend to last longer there tends to be a lower risk of rejection. So when people get a kidney transplant, the body's natural reaction is to try to get rid of this foreign, this foreign object that's in the body. But with a live donor kidney, uh, that's, there's less of a risk of your body trying to reject that kidney. People with living donor transplants generally have better overall health. And another major benefit is that you can have a transplant before you start dialysis, so thereby skipping dialysis altogether. And again, you know, if you are interested in trying to find a live donor, your kidney care team uh, or your dialysis team is a, a great resource for that. So transplants do take time. So even if you are planning uh, to get a kidney transplant, there is a wait time. So it can take a long time to do all the tests. Uh, if you have a potential donor, it can take a while for the donor to get all their tests done. Again, all these tests are very necessary because the doctors wanna make sure that you and your donor um, are safe to go through the surgery. So if your kidneys you know, do fail before your transplant operation can happen, it's still important um, to have um, uh, a decision made about what type of dialysis you want to, would want to go on. So at this point, I'll pass it on to my colleague to start talking about the dialysis options. Oh, be before we get right into that, maybe we'll just intersperse a couple little questions here. Um, so we've got a couple come through to the chat. And again, as a reminder to everybody, please put in your questions in that Q&A uh, uh, box. So uh, a couple came up. Now, one, um, and I think I'll I have the point to this question, is if somebody's got uh, a donor in mind and or has a donor that's ready to go, and maybe they're not quite at the point where they would otherwise need a transplant or treatment for kidney failure just yet, uh, are there times where the team might do this early um, to try to avoid either a change in their health or uh, you know, just try to get it done sooner rather than later? Or would they wait until somebody gets to a point that they, that they need it? 
Yeah. So, you know, there is a a certain uh, GFR level that the doctors do wait for, for someone to get a transplant. Um, I believe it's about 10, Dr. Bevilacqua, you can correct me if I'm wrong. And so the timing is important. Um, you know, basically the doctors don't want you to undergo a surgery before you really have to. They're also trying to balance though how you're feeling. So they do take into account your symptoms uh, as your kidney function is going down. Um, so those are some of the things that they take into consideration. Um, mm -hmm. The testing, you know, some of the tests can sometimes expire. So it's a real, uh, it's a real balancing game to try to get you get you all you all through the tests, get you approved, get your donor approved at the right time. So um, there'll be lots of conversations uh, between you and your kidney, uh, your kidney team about timing. Yeah, perfect. Perfect answer, Zina. And yeah, and exactly right. The part that I'd add, that I love the wording you used at the beginning where you said it's a treatment, not a cure, meaning at all treatments do come with their ups and downsides. And so the other reason we don't do it early is because if someone doesn't need it yet, we don't want to expose to all those potential, uh, you know, risks or downsides uh, involved in the surgery itself, plus the, the medication thereafter. This question comes up a lot. It's a frequent one of, oh, why not just do it now if I know I'm going to be heading there eventually? Uh, and, and why? It's a very good question. Um, I'll also say the, the other question in was around some of the specific risks to the donor. Um, and for that one, I'll, um, maybe point over to the session on the recorded webinars. There's one that goes into a lot of detail just about transplant and there's a whole section about that. Um, the short answer is that uh, we always tell people that the donor will actually go through more tests than the person receiving the kidney because the, the team wants to make 100% sure that they're not putting that donor at any undue risk and that the kidney function that they have is gonna be more than enough to last them for the rest of their lives. So um, that's the long, that's the, the short answer. But if you want to get the long, uh, more detailed one, please go check out that other session that goes into this in, in a lot of detail. Okay, those are the couple of questions. Just a little bit of, a, of an intermission there. But then otherwise, um, now, I'm sorry, I've forgotten the order. Was it Leilani that we're going to? Yes, I think it is. But yes, it is. Did you go, Leilani? Yeah. All right. Let me know. Yeah, perfect. Sorry for this. Okay, let me just Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, my name is Leilani. I'm an RN working in peritoneal dialysis of Royal Columbian Hospital here in U.S. Minister. And this afternoon, I'm going to talk about uh, PD or peritoneal dialysis, which is one option for patients who have uh, end-stage renal failure. So what is peritoneal dialysis? In simplest term, peritoneal dialysis is basically it's a home type of dialysis that you use your own body using your peritoneal membrane. That is why it's called peritoneal dialysis because you use your peritoneum. So it's a membrane that actually lines our abdominal organs because it's very vascular, which used to filter the toxic waste from our body using a special solution. So how does it work? So basically, a PD or peritoneal dialysis requires you to do an exchange. So in, in simplest term, you actually fill yourself, allow yourself to be filled with the fluid through the PD catheter, which is in here, and it goes to this peritoneal membrane in which you allow the fluid to sit there or to dwell for approximately four to six hours period. And then when you drain that fluid, all the toxins and unwanted waste from your body goes into the drain. So again, PD requires an exchange of a cycle of draining, draining the old fluid that has been dwelled into your peritoneal cavity, filling with the fresh fluid in, 
and allowing it to sit there for a certain amount of time, depending on the prescription of your nephrologist. So in order for you to start PD or peritoneal dialysis, you need to have a catheter. So the picture here on your left is the actual picture of a, how a PD catheter looks like. It is a flexible tubing, a silicon one, that's either coiled or a straight catheter. As you can see in this picture, there's actually a tiny little holes in it. So this holes allow the exit and the entry of the fluid that goes into your cavity. On the other side of the picture in your right side is how well healed PD catheter is showing after the procedure. So here is your exit site. This will be your PD catheter will stay permanent until you're doing PD dialysis. And then there's a titanium is the metal part on here. And then we connect what we call a transfer set that connects into your PD tube. Normally the transfer set, we change it every six months just to avoid the risk of infection. So the PD catheter can be inserted on the bedside by a trained nephrologist. So meaning you come into our unit and we schedule your PD catheter insertion. However, for those patients who has previous abdominal surgeries, uh, scars on their belly or history of hernia, you need to be assessed by a trained surgeon and she will be, or she or he will determine if you are suitable to do uh, OR insertion. So there are two types of PD. It, it's called the continuous ambulatory peritoneal dialysis, popularly known as CAPD, or using a machine called continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis. So what are the difference between the two types? So in CAPD, you actually manually hang a bag into a pole using a dialysate or a twin bag, we call it twin bag or manual exchange, wherein you hang the bag into the pole, allow this fluid to fill up your peritoneal cavity. So after you fill yourself up, you disconnect yourself, and then you're good to go to do your normal routine. Normally you will allow the fluid to sit there for four to six hours. Four to six hours later, you come back, hang a new fresh bag, First thing you will do is to drain that fluid that you put four hours and then put fresh one in and then repeat the cycle. Ideally, CAPD is good for patients who love to travel, love to camping, and when there's a power outage. So it's done four times a day. You do three exchanges in the morning during the day, four to six hours in between, and then at nighttime, you put a special solution that let it dwell or sit in your belly overnight. On the other hand, the other type of dialysis is what we call the continuous cycling peritoneal dialysis, wherein instead of using a manual exchange, you use a machine called Cycler while you're sleeping. So the Cycler automatically do the exchanges. You don't have to do anything. All you have to do is before you go to sleep or you can set it up ahead of time. It probably will take you about half an hour to set it up. And then when you are ready, you connect yourself into the tubing, into the cycler to your PD catheter. It approximately takes about eight to 10 hours, depending on your prescription to be on the cycler. So when you wake up in the morning, the machine automatically fills you up with the fluid to dwell for the rest of the day so that you don't need to worry about the exchanges. So these are the type of machine that's available on the market. So this one is what we call the home choice. Both are made from Baxter. And this is the new cycler that we have right now. So it actually has a screen on it and it will exactly tell you how to set it up. So why choose PD or what are the benefits of PD over other modality? So PD is a choice because of its flexibility. Flexibility in the sense that you can do your dialysis at the convenience of your home. You don't need to schedule yourself to come to the hospital, less hospital visit to do your dialysis. 
You, you can do it any time of the day. You can do it eight o'clock in the morning or eight o'clock at night. You can use the cycler if you want to, or you can use the manual exchange if you're traveling. So you have the independence to go back to your normal activity and to live a normal life and to have that quality of life. So another thing with PD is it's flexible because you can travel almost part, all over part of the world. The only thing with traveling though, is you have to make a plan ahead of time. Usually Baxter, who is the company that delivers your supplies, requires at least three to four months of notice if you're traveling outside Canada and US. But if you're in Canada, they only require one month. So another benefits, why choose PD is it's because it's gentler on your system or on your body. Gentler in the sense that less invasive, it's bloodless. You avoid the pain of needling because the only time you see needles and when they put your PD catheter, all you have to do is to connect the tubing, the, the bag in the tubing to your PD catheter. Since you're doing PD every day, it, it is proven that it preserves your kidney function longer than compared with the conventional uh, hemodialysis. So when it comes to diet, PD is known to have less restriction when it comes to diet. In fact, while you are in PD, they encourage you to eat more protein because when we do your exchanges, some of the protein goes into the bag. However, if you are considering to do PD, there are some things you need to consider. So no shower for about approximately three weeks after the PD catheter insertion. No hot tubs because of a high risk of infection. Although you can swim, but you can only swim on a chlorinated pool or an open sea. Since PD is a self-type of management, it requires commitment. So for training, uh, for the twin bag, we train you first doing the twin bag or the manual exchange, uh, maybe three to four days, depending on your learning needs. And for the cycler, we do train you about two to three days. And again, depending on your learning needs. With regards to the supply, Baxter is the company that delivers your supplies. You don't need to worry because it's a free of charge. It's covered under BC Renal Agency program. If the space is your issue, we can consider maybe assessing your home. You can either deliver your supply monthly or bi-weekly for those patients who's living in a small space. So the question now is that I want to leave to the audience is, are you considering PD or peritoneal dialysis as your treatment option? If the answer is yes, feel free to talk to your nephrologist, and then we are more than welcome to give you a detailed PD orientation. There is also a good website in BC Renal through BC Renal Agency. Just go to search button and type peritoneal dialysis. Now I'd like to introduce you one of our patients, um, Bab, she's been our patient since May of 2019. Just, before you get started, uh, Bev, oh, can, sorry, I, yeah, sorry, can I just interest first one little question here? And then I definitely want you to get at it. Sure. Uh, just because this one comes up a lot. So one of the questions came through the, the chat is if people are doing this way of doing dialysis at home at night, uh, what happens, you know, if they need to, get up and go to the washroom or something like this. Is this is this doable? This question comes up always all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah, something yeah, people can work with. Yeah, this is a very common question too when we are training our patients. So if you are although you're connected to the cycler at night, there's actually there's an option that you can pause the machine to disconnect in the middle of the night. All you have to do is which we will teach you on your training day, uh just press pause. You can temporarily disconnect yourself, and then when you're done, you can just resume. The other option, too, is the tube requires you to walk about 24 feet away from the machine. Although you're tied up into the machine, it has that flexibility that you can still walk around. Perfect. Thank you, Leilani. Uh, yes, that you. one always comes up. Okay, so sorry. You were just at Leilani's comments. Uh, thanks for sharing that. That's great. Great job, uh, Leilani. You're welcome. 
oh wait, I'll stop derailing things. Uh, well, I won't. I'll keep doing this, you know, as we go through the sections. But <laughs> it looks like so now we're over to, to Zoila to talk about uh, Hema Dow. Thank you, Dr. Mike. Thanks, Leilani and Beth. Thank you very much. So my name is Zoila. I'm the clinical nurse educator for Royal Columbian Hemodialysis Unit. So basically, I will be sharing uh, information about, uh, regarding hemodialysis. So I'm going to share my slide now. Can you guys see it? Um, not yet. Okay. Oh, it's just loading. It's doing something. You're good. Okay, good. Thank you. So um, again, um, hemodialysis is another type of dialysis. In this section, basically, we will learn about what it is, what the vascular access is, what the different options are, possible drawbacks of hemo or hemodialysis. So what is hemodialysis? So hemodialysis actually, uh, we use a machine to remove waste products, um, extra fluid, and overall clean uh, your blood and then return it to your body. This can be done at home or in a hospital or a community dialysis setting. Um, and then to do hemodialysis, there needs to be a way to connect your bl uh, blood vessel to the hemodialysis machine. Uh, hemodialysis access or vascular access can either be fistula or catheter, but keep in mind a fistula is the gold standard, meaning that is the best choice. Um, a fistula is created when a surgeon connects an artery and a vein together, wherein you can see it from this image here. Um, once the fistula is ready, it becomes a natural part of your body and provides good flow and a dialysis connection point that can, be, can last decades. Another axis is a catheter. So um, more information regarding uh, fistula. So a fistula cannot be used right away after the creation, unfortunately. So getting the fistula way before you begin hemodialysis is best as it takes a while, sometimes many months, for it to be ready for use. So normally when you are being seen by pre-dialysis clinic, they will be the one identifying when they can send you and start having a uh, uh, clinic or uh, seen by the vascular doctor to decide when can we uh, book your fistula creation. Um, the benefits of uh, fistula. For more people, a fistula is best choice because it performs the best, lasts the longest, has uh, fewer complications such as infection, is safe to shower and swim, and requires fewer hospitalizations. The second type of access that we use in the hemodialysis is a catheter. Um, it, it is generally less preferred way to connect your blood to the hemo machine. Uh, so a catheter is a Y-shaped plastic tube that goes into your vein, into your neck. This type of access is most commonly used in emergency situations, for example, when someone needs to start before the fistula is ready for use. Uh, hemodialysis options. So basically, there's like two types under hemodialysis. It's either you can do it uh, independently or what we call home-based hemodialysis. And the second one is dependent or clinic-based hemodialysis, which means you are doing it um, in the hospital or community dialysis unit. So um, home-based hemodialysis can be done at home, as I mentioned earlier. You can do it in your own time. So the schedule is up to you and it's very flexible. This will further be discussed uh, later after my presentation, actually. Some people prefer to have uh, the healthcare staff to do most of the work for the dialysis. So that's why we have the setting in the hospital and again in the community dialysis unit. Uh, your dialysis, when you prefer to do the dependent or clinic-based hemodialysis, will be set by us, usually four hours each time, three times a week or sometimes four. Um, in the hemodialysis unit, uh, we are open in the hospital setting. We are open um, Monday to Sunday. There's no such thing as um, statutory holiday, uh, but you can be scheduled for uh, morning, noon, evening, or even nocturnal dialysis. And then um, my last uh, slide is actually... Um, Two people on hemodialysis, one is home-based hemo or doing it in your own home again. 
and the other one is a clinic-based home setting. In looking at these pictures, think about what the different benefits of each of these two hemo options and which option might work best for you. This can be discussed with your uh, primary nephrologist or when you see uh, them in the pre-dialysis uh, clinic. That is just, uh, that's all for my presentation. Like I am ready to answer if there is any question. Uh, no, not, nothing yet, Zoila. Uh, but yeah, everyone get your questions in and we'll, there'll also be time uh, at the end as well. So if you don't, if you miss them for the, the specific section, just go ahead and keep getting those questions in. We'll come back to the end. We know nothing else. So you're off the hot seat for, for now, Zoila, and we can, um, oh, someone just got one in right in the nick of time here. Let's ask that. That's okay. I, I, I lied. Uh, this is a very good question. Um, so if people are doing a dialysis in a facility uh, setting and they want to travel around, mm -hmm. is that still possible or how would that be set up? It is definitely possible. So as long as you notify us ahead of time, uh, basically, the process is we ask you to look for the dialysis unit where you are planning to go and then get the information, the contact information from that uh, facility. And then we will be the one connecting to that dialysis unit to make sure that whatever they required for you to go, what paperwork you required will be sent to them by us. So, um, again, granted that like we the, the nephrologist will clear you that everything is okay uh hemodynamically, hemodynamically wise for you to travel but yes definitely you can go perfect thanks uh okay so yeah it looks like cindy we're over to you with uh home hemodialysis hi uh my name is Cindy. I'm one of the nurses working in home hemodialysis in Fraser Health. So I'm going to prepare my screen here. Can you see? Um, not yet. Sometimes it's a bit slow, but... Sorry. You know. Okay. Oh, there we are. And yeah, just got to start the slideshow. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Can you see now? Yeah, perfect. Okay. So, um, home hemodialysis. Uh, overview for today, I'm going to talk about the benefits of home hemodialysis. Introduce two machines that are available in home hemo training units some highlights in the training process. And the most importantly, I, we have uh, Barry Davis here to share his experiences. So what is home hemodialysis? Home hemodialysis is an independent, home-based hemodialysis that allows you the flexibility to complete your hemodialysis treatment in the comfort of your home. Home hemodialysis also allows you to have more control over your schedule than the clinic-based dialysis. If you see this photo, this gentleman sitting in very comfortable area to sit and read. And also uh, this lady, uh, she has her machine in her bedroom, so she dialyzes while she's sleeping. Also, we have patient who lives in a trailer he has a machine in a trailer. So now let's talk about the uh, advantages of doing dialysis at home. It's often more gentle on the body because you have the opportunity to do longer and more frequent sessions. This speaks that to, to the fact that if you do dialysis at home, you can make the treatment fit your schedule. Basic dialysis offered in center is four hours, three times a week. Home hemodialysis gives you an ability to complete more than minimum amount of dialysis. So if you're able to do more dialysis, generally your body will feel better. You will have more energy. You'll have fewer diet restrictions. Dialyzing at home gives you more independence and the risk of infection will be reduced. 
It gives you a flexibility to be at home to fulfill parenting and work responsibilities. You'll continue with some of your favorite activities as well. Our patients are able to go back to school and start a school program. We can have uh, some other considerations for home hemo. Um, training can be a big commitment. It is a lot of learning. Um, it takes about eight to 12 weeks. You can train alone or with a support person. Um, when you are when you're on when you are at home, um, you still need to go to blood work once a month. You will come to see the doctor every once in three months. You have to do machine setup and maintenance, so it has been compared to a part time job. Now I'm going to talk about the machines we have in home hemo training units. We have AK ninety eight in the left. Next stage on the right. So the AK system is the most comparable to a conventional dialysis machine. It requires dialysis three times a week, usually for at least four hours. For reference, most people who get dialysis in center run three times a week for four hours. So the AK has pretty much the same efficiency as most machines. It is user friendly and easy to troubleshoot. This machine requires a minor renovation that is paid for by BC Vino. The slide shows the renovation. It will be paid for by BC Reno and BC Reno will reverse required renovations when patients come off dialysis. This looks like a water supply here and some PVC pipes attached to the wall and possibly some electrical modifications as well. Sorry. Uh, next machine is next stage system. It is very uh, simple interface. The top portion is transportable. This top portion is transportable. It weighs about 100 pounds with travel case. So if you want to go on a vacation and want to bring your machine, you will provide a travel case. And we're going to provide a travel case and help you deliver to your travel destinations. BC Reno allows travel supplies for up to four weeks per year. This machine requires more hours of dialysis for you to get basic dialysis. The bare minimum amount of dialysis you have to do is between 16 to 20 hours per week. This machine does not require any renovations. It connects into existing water source and drain system. Now I'm um, gonna talk about the training. Patients are trained with either a fistula or catheter, which is in place. Training typically takes about six to eight weeks. Sometimes it's a bit more longer than eight to 12 weeks. Patient can um, have friends and family members also attending the training. And um, every patient is given as much time in training as they need to feel comfortable and confident going home. So we don't usually send the patient until they say they're ready to go home and they can do it independently. So what does uh, home hemo training looks like? You're gonna dialyze while uh, you're learning home hemo machines. It's average three to three to four days per week for six to eight weeks. It's one-to-one -one personalized training. You're gonna learn 
how to set up the machine, how to connect to your dialysis access, also how to monitor your treatment during the session, and how to finish, how to take down your machines and how to keep it clean. Also, you're gonna learn how to take care of your vascular access and how to solve any home hemo related problems. A lot of time, it can be the machine issues or the clinical issues. You're gonna learn all about how to take care of yourself at home. Also, you're gonna learn how to uh, order the home hemo supplies. So next I am going to talk about the supplies. These supplies will be delivered to your home every four weeks, uh, but if you have a uh, storage space for four weeks of supplies at home, you could either get a delivery uh, bi-weekly. And when you see the picture, the storage space is roughly around the size of a double closet. We have so many patients who lives in a small apartment. Also, we have someone living in a trailer. So, so far the space wasn't a big concern. If it is the concern, you can always talk to the nurse and uh, we're gonna have some ideas what to do. Next, um, we have uh, one of our patients, Barry Davis will talk about his experiences. Barry has been home since Christmas time and he has just a lot thing to share with us. Here you go, Barry. Thanks, Cindy. Thank you. I don't know if you can see me on the screen or how to get, oh. oh, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I don't know how to get on the screen, so I'll just, I'm up in the corner, I'll talk. Uh, I started dialysis a year ago, February, <clears throat> and uh, I just hated it. I hated going to the hospital. I hated going to the clinics. I just, you know, you have to be there this time of day and you can't, you can't make your own times of it. They tell you, you're going to do this. And it didn't always work for what I wanted to do in life. And I kept reading about things and I looked at PD much like Bev and I probably talked to the same nephrologist she did. Uh, I couldn't do PD because I had a ileostomy, so I had a bag on my side and you couldn't have both. Uh -huh. I kept reading and reading and I found this NX, the life changer, absolute, sorry. We do it at home now, when I want, not when they want. We do it four times a week. We we try to have our Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. Doesn't always work. We might do it Sunday, Monday, take Tuesday, Wednesday up, do it Thursday, Friday. But we get our four days in a week. You're at home. It's great. Training. We had Cindy and Sarah up in Abbotsford. Uh, we talked to Dr. B. That's why I, I can't say his name, so I call him Dr. B. Uh, when we first went to Abbotsford to see about doing the home dialysis, because all we'd ever heard was PD. I couldn't do it, so that kind of, but I kept reading and reading and reading, and I seen this little machine. And we live in the country, so we have a, a septic tank. We couldn't use the big machine. We couldn't use that much water with the septic tank, because there's seven people living in the house. And this little NX machine, I kept reading and reading. I read the whole manual from BC Renal before I ever went to see Sarah and them up in Abbotsford. And, and she was quite astonished that I had done that. And I kept trying to talk my wife into helping me. Finally did. Smartest move we made. I wouldn't... Uh... Oh, independence is... We get to do as we want, not... The other people, the nurses are, have all been great everywhere. I probably was the worst of the patients they had. But uh, now my my wife is the nurse to me now. And she'll, 
she'll probably agree with the other nurses now too. So, but I think coming home just opens up so many doors for yourself to get away from having everybody telling you what to do. You get to do what you want, when you want. If you want to do it in the morning, you want to do it in the afternoon, you want to do it in the evening, go ahead, do it, pick your time and do it. Uh, if you got doctor's appointments, you got other appointments, go to see your grandchildren play soccer. You get to go watch them, come home and do your dialysis. The other way you couldn't go because you had to be there to have your dialysis done at this time of day. Uh, they treat you like a million dollars when you're getting trained. Up in Abbotsford, Cindy and Sarah were absolutely fantastic. And we had Antoinette up there. And what was the other girl's name? Corinne. Corinne she was up there. Corinne and Antoinette work out of, out of uh, right. New West, uh, which we go to now because we're in Pitt Meadows. We're in between Abbotsford and, and New West. But if you're going for training, Abbotsford was a better drive for us than driving through the rush hour to go to New West. Uh, we still go out to see them out in Abbotsford. We have met a couple of people that were on one couple is in, I think, getting trained right now on on the NX machine. Uh, they've got Marsha's number, my wife's phone number, so the wife does. So she can phone because it, it does get a little hectic sometimes. And you want to talk to someone away from that isn't the nurse, isn't the doctor. It does, you know, they're just someone you know from the thing. And, I think it's up to us as as patients, as people that got trained, to help to get people to go home. Uh, oh, yeah. Supplies. We live in we gotta go up the stairs. I, I have a stair lift for me to go up. I can't carry them up the stairs. They carry them up the stairs, smile and laugh. They it's just a totally mm -hmm. different way of doing things. I, I'm just so glad I did it. You don't respect so oh, many. Yeah, I, I just think, you know, and, and it's up to us. I, I waited for I don't know how many months to have someone tell me about this. And I had to do it myself. And I think we have to make sure people know. Excuse me. Thank you so much, Barry. I'll be back. Okay. Thank you. Would you mind me asking one question, though? Yeah, just one. No, it's okay. <laughs> yeah, just one. Just one. <laughs> okay. So what advice do you have for someone who's in the process of making a treatment decision like you? I think they should talk to the, the training staff and the doctors, much like what we did when we went out, we met. We had to do our little thing, lift up a gallon jug and, and hook up, push the takeaways together and make sure we could do that and then have a talk with the doctor. And, and I, I believe it was Antoinette who came with us to see Dr. B in Abbotsford. Uh, then we went, I think at that time, I, th I, I really do think that it would be nice to have someone that's already doing it at home to talk to. Not someone, not the nurses or the doctors or everybody, yeah, yeah, have someone that's actually doing it and or even in the training and, and that you can sit and talk to, watch them, uh, have a coffee with them, whatever, and just see the difference of, of, of it. Because everyone I've talked to at the hospital, at the clinics, they've uh, there's such a myth out there that you have to have a separate room for everything. You got to have a garage to put your supplies in. You got to have all this. It's it's and a lot of it is a myth, and it's not. It's time consuming. Don't don't get me wrong, but it's your time. It's not someone else's time. And I would I would definitely and I would leave my name and phone number at, at with you and Sarah and the West people if they've been to the trainers and done it. I will talk to them anytime, anywhere. I'll even bring them to the house and let them see it. And, and have a coffee with them. I, I just think that's the only way we're going to get people to go home is to let them know how easy it is to do. That's great. Thank you so much again. Um, now back to Dr. Mike. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Sorry.
No, thank both of you. And thank you, Barry. I mean, it's clear how much this, this means to you. And, and to your point, this is what you're doing right now is sharing it with all these people on the webinar who are interested in hearing more. So, you know, thank you so much for doing that. So it's clear how big of a difference this has made for your life. So that's amazing. Um, Actually, so Cindy, yeah, you're, you're getting off easy right now. There's no questions in the box oh, for you just okay. yet. Um, <laughs> everyone, feel free to get your questions in. Again, we'll we'll regroup at the end as well. So, so there's still time to get those questions in if you like. Otherwise, yeah, we're uh, back over to Sandra. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen here. Oops. Okay. Um, yeah, that was really interesting, Barry. Really good for us to have an understanding of what it's like to go through the home hemo. So thank you. Yeah, so I'm Sandra. I'm the social. I'm a social worker that works at um, the kidney care clinic in Abbotsford. So I'm going to finish up the options education with uh, conservative care. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So. So conservative care means um, choosing not to do dialysis and not to have a kidney transplant. So the goal is to preserve the kidney function for as long as possible with diet and medication. Um, it may not prolong life, but it will help with symptom management. And the focus is on quality of life rather than extending life. I'm just going to make sure. Um, yeah, so if you choose conservative care, you'll still get medical care. Your healthcare team will be with you the whole way through. Choosing not to pursue dialysis does not mean that other treatments are not available to you. So the focus for someone who chooses this option is to reduce the symptoms of their non-functioning kidneys and to make them as comfortable as possible. Okay, I'm just going to play this short little video. I just want to make sure that I've got my sound share on. Okay, here we go. My kidneys went right down to 6%. They wanted to put me on dialysis, but that's one thing my family did know and my doctor, that I said no dialysis. If I get that far gone, I'll take my chances. And at my age, I can't see any sense in it. And even the specialist agrees with me. He says, it might give you another year, you know, or so, but it wouldn't be a quality of life that, that I would want. Okay. Okay, so conservative care is a choice. If it is your choice, um, the kidney care team will continue to provide medical and emotional support. Um, your symptoms would be managed with diet and medication. And additionally, and regardless, if you choose to go with conservative care or another treatment option, it's really good to start to think about advanced care planning as well. And um, you can either have a representation agreement made up or the My Voice booklet is a really good tool to work through with your family and jot down your healthcare wishes just so that they know what your wishes are if anything happened and you were you weren't ever able to speak for yourself. So you, you can feel confident that your wishes will be followed. Um, that's, that's about it for the conservative care. So I'm gonna stop sharing. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Sandra. And yeah, we'll see if uh, questions come through. Um, Otherwise, yeah, it's great. I see everyone coming back on. It's just good. There's a couple of questions that maybe we'll put to the various uh, groups here. We'll bounce them back and forth uh, into everyone on the call. Again, just go ahead and put those, those questions in play. Um, so one of them, it's been there for a while. We were getting to it. Don't worry, I was waiting for this time. Um, so this is a good one when we're talking about the different types of dialysis. So we've heard about uh, PD. We've heard about home hemodialysis. We've talked about facility-based dialysis. One of the very practical questions is, is there a difference in terms of things like diet restrictions uh, between these various different types of dialysis? Um, I don't know if anybody wants to first take a crack at that. It's almost like we have the different people here with, with their own team if they want to put in their answer. I can, Dr. Mike. Oh, all right. Okay. Zoila's going at it first. 
Okay, so uh, it's not really, you know, unfortunately, when you pick hemodialysis, like there will be so much limitation because like, again, compared to uh, doing the home modality, which is either home dialysis or peritoneal dialysis, when the, the only time your kidney is working when you do hemodialysis is when you are in the hemodialysis unit, which is again, based on my presentation, four hours in a day, and then again, it will be three times a week. So definitely for the, the, the restriction for the food that you need to take and even the fluid, we will be really keeping an eye on it. If patient is doing a dialysis at home, they they own the machine at home. So basically they're doing more hours than the clinic based dialysis. We have so many patients are doing like more than seven, eight hours and uh, their uh, blood works looks great. Also, they're really liberal to their diet, which means they can eat the best choice of their food and they don't really limit the diet, right? So it's been great for home hemo patients. And um, for PD patients, oh, Barry, you want to go ahead? Sorry. I was just going to say, I eat and drink whatever I want. There you I mean, go. No alcohol, but I, I eat and drink whatever I want. I don't, I don't have no limits on yeah. what I eat or drink. And I, I feel fine. I feel a lot better than I did when I was going to the clinic, I'll tell you that. Perfect. No, that's good endorsement for sure. And Leilani, sorry, you were saying? And for PD patients, um, usually it, the fluid intake, it depends on how much urine output, correct me, Dr. Mike, if I'm wrong, urine output do they still make? Like That's why every time they come for a clinic, we ask them, do you still pee, right? For patient who's peeing less than a 200 cc, they only allowed like two, about a liter per day. And that's including water, juice, or anything liquid. But if, if you are being like more than a thousand, for sure you can have two liters in 24 hours. And when it comes to diet, your actually protein intake is more liberal. Like they ask you to eat more protein, as I have said in my presentation, like every time you do an exchange, some of the protein goes into the bag. So they encourage you to eat more protein and more potassium. Yeah, per, all perfect answers. And so to summarize, mm -hmm. so Leilani, a very good point saying that, yes, this is individual, and this is why each of our programs have, um, <clears throat> excuse me, each have dietitians associated with them to mm -hmm. see exactly what's right for you. But on the whole, just like you kind of heard everybody said, it does tend to be that with either PD or home hemodialysis, there tends to be fewer dietary restrictions than there are on facility-based hemodialysis. Some of the main things that we're restricting, fluid, potassium and, and uh, phosphate. And for those last two, actually, for sometimes for our patients who are on home dialysis, we're actually having to supplement those things. So the dialysis is so good, we're actually having to give people potassium or give them phosphate, as opposed to having to really work to limit those when you're on uh, facility-based dialysis. So really good question. Yeah, and, say, and sorry, the question was just as we were talking, I was asking about uh, uh, protein. Sorry, yeah, often when we're talking about things like phosphate, that is one of the places that we're talking about it, is that it comes from protein. Uh, and and yeah, so it is it is much more liberal than what we're seeing in facility-based dialysis. Um, great, okay, so another uh, question that came through, just again, maybe this is the difference between peritoneal dialysis and home hemodialysis. Both of these, there was some talk about doing it overnight. Maybe we'll start with peritoneal dialysis. So when we're talking about that with peritoneal dialysis, are we talking about doing overnight every day, as in seven days a week? Well, ideally, it should be every day. Again, it depends on so many factors, like what's your GFR? How do you feel like? So if you skip like one day without di without cycler or without an exchange, nothing really will happen to you. So ideally, it should be every day. <laughs> Dr. Mike said, Don't tell people who say that. But, but it depends depends yeah. on how you feel, right? But it should be every day to get a better better outcome of it. It should be done every day, either on a cycler or on a twin bed. So that's the beauty of, of being on PD. If you on the cycler, you're having a lot of alarms and you have a compromised sleep, 
And then the one that we recommend rather than skipping your dialysis is probably sit your twin bag, put 7.5 overnight so that there's no interruption of sleep. And then you can proceed to the cycle the following night. Yeah, perfect. And yes, things happen. Yeah. People will miss a night. But yeah, on the whole, we're talking about that as being an everyday type of thing. Yeah. And then, so Cindy, when we're talking about people who do nocturnal or do a uh, home, he home hemodialysis, mm -hmm. uh, they're doing at nighttime. Is that something that they're doing every day? Um, usually, uh, well, before I talk about the machine selection, right? So for the next stage, the bare minimum is between 16 to 20 hours. So usually the recommendation is at least four times a week. But if they want to do more than four times, like five times or six times, it's all up to them. A lot of patients are choosing a bit more than four times, though. For the AK machine, it requires three times minimum, but patients are usually doing every other day or two and one off, two and one off. So basically, they are doing more than three times a week. But we have patients who's doing three nights in one week. As, as so from Cindy's response, you, you can see that in home hemodialysis, we're really thinking kind of like hours per week. Right. What's the cumulative amount? Um, yeah. so exactly. Even so, they're doing nocturnal, they still want to do like three, four times a week. Yeah. It's more hours, so it's more benefit on them. Yeah, exactly. Something like that. Mm -hmm. the, the specific question about, oh, what if, if it was nocturnal, would it be seven days a week? That's the one where I'd say probably not. That's one of the rare situations where it's actually possible to do too much dialysis. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's hard, but it is possible. And that would be the case if you're in that situation, you'd be doing almost 50 hours a week of dialysis. Right, and that's right. be a, a little bit much. Right. Perfect. Um, okay. Um, well, we haven't got any more questions coming in just yet. So here, I'm going to put a couple little things on the screen. And just see if it well if anyone's going to get into the last minute uh, uh, questions in. But just as a reminder, that was our question slide, which we're doing. Uh, oh, sorry, the thing I didn't mention there is just um, after this session, everybody will be getting uh, in the email a little feedback uh, form. So please do you know fill that out. That's how we know uh, what works for these sessions and, and how to make them better. Uh, otherwise, I just wanted to mention a couple last items here. Uh, just uh, more resources if you're interested. So in addition to ours, which um, will will be up online uh, shortly, and I showed you the website for the BC Renal one, there's these other places. So the Kidney Foundation of Canada has this absolute great website uh, that uh, has a lot of these resources on there called the Kidney Wellness Hub, a host of different uh, materials out there. And actually, it was, uh, to Barry's point earlier, they can actually even um, set up what's called a peer mentor. So if you're interested in hearing more about this from somebody who's gone through the process, in addition to people who, who volunteer locally, they have a whole group of people across uh, the province that they can connect you with if you wanted to talk with somebody uh, about it. So this is the information for, for them there. And uh, even if you just put in Kidney Foundation or their website, Kidney VA, you'll find it. But that's their information about that program. Uh, again, you'll um, ha get the website uh, or sorry, get the uh, link to the evaluation in your email there. Um, and the one other uh, reminder I want to give is that, again, if you have the BC Renal website, usually within a couple of weeks, a recording of this very session will be on there if you want to review it once more. So those are the last um, couple uh, of questions. Oh, one has come in just now. Okay, we've got it in the last minute here. This is a good question it's about transplant. Um, so. We talked about, you know, living donor transplants potentially happening before somebody goes on dialysis. And then people can go on the deceased donor transplant list after they started dialysis. What if somebody has started dialysis, but then finds a donor? Are they still able to do a living donor transplant after they started dialysis? Or do they have to then uh, go on to deceased donor? Yeah, that's a great question. And absolutely, you can have a living donor either before or after dialysis. It's really only um, the deceased donor that you have to think in your head, okay, I can only get a deceased donor kidney transplant after I'm on dialysis. But a live donor, anytime in your kidney journey. Absolutely. And yeah, there's still some of those benefits Christina talked about 
still apply that it, even sometimes we have people who are almost going to be up on the wait list for a deceased donor transplant, but someone comes forward, actually for a lot of reasons, a living donor transplant, you know, it can still be beneficial compared to a deceased donor transplant. So absolutely like that. Um, okay, otherwise, yeah, so that was all the questions on the list. So then I just want to thank everybody. You know, I want to thank everybody for attending here today, for taking time on your Friday afternoon to, to learn more about this. This is fantastic. And I want to thank our great panel. We've got a, you know, a big panel here for Fraser Health. I want to thank so Sandra, uh, I'm going to go in order. So Sandra, uh, Leilani, Zoila, and Cindy, you know, thanks to each of you for sharing. Oh, sorry, Christina. Uh, I'm just going down my boxes here for sharing your expertise in doing this. Um, I want to thank uh, behind the scenes. We've had a Amber and Alexis and Janet from the BC Renal Science has helped set up the, the technical support here to make these sessions happen. And then most of all, again, I can't thank enough uh, Barry and Bev uh, the two of you for coming and sharing your very personal, very emotional stories. It's always the feedback we get is that people the most want to hear from somebody who's uh, actually gone through the process. So I can't thank the two of you enough for, for sharing uh, with all these people who are thinking about uh, going through this process. So thank you for doing that. Okay, and then to everyone on the line, thanks again for attending. We hope to see you at our next session. Okay, have a good afternoon, everyone.